Major funding for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Well, we are halfway through the calendar year and many counties, cities, and communities are just finalizing their 2013 budgets or already have. The general consensus is while the intensity of this crisis and the historic recession have faded, caution still rules the day, as well it should. Welcome back to the longest running and the most widely watched source for Carolina business and public policy. I'm Chris William. And also this year, in many communities, as public spending is debated, education continues to be at the center of many of those heated battles. On this installment of CBR, we discuss the current issues around this political lightning rod and later on, the longest serving college president in the Tar Heel State, Jerry McGee from Wingate University. Major funding also by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded June 22, 2012. On this week's program, Molly Shaw of Communities and Schools of Charlotte-Mecklenburg, Jonathan Yarborough of the South Carolina Department of Commerce, and special guest, Dr. Jerry McGee, president of Wingate University. Now, Chris Williams. Hello, welcome again to our program. Molly, nice to have you back on the program. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Good Great to see to you. Here. Uh, Jonathan, welcome. Glad to be here. From the hottest spot in the Carolinas. Uh, and I know you, Columbia has taken that and turned that into a whole logo. Right. Uh, all right, well, let's get to the task at hand. Education. Here, uh, you, you, folks, we have uh, someone recently said that when we talk about our educational system, that this system is a lot like healthcare. It, there's its patchwork. Uh, there are a thousand levers. It goes in a bunch of different directions. It seems that everybody wants the same thing, and that is a good outcome, kids that are graduating. But we seem to really struggle with how to get that done. Molly, how do we dial this down and make it more simple? Does it need to be made more simple? Well, I, I think it's really important to first think about how we talk about it. Um, you know, and really ensure that people understand how imperative it is that, that we fix Don't you think system. people understand that, though? Well, I, I don't think people really understand the long-term potential here and, and the potential economic um, implications of, of our current system. And so we've got to come together. We've got to figure out a way that, that we make this work and, and that we do simplify it. Yeah, okay. From uh, Jonathan, from the economic, and I'm going to give you a chance, by the way, to, to, to back that up, uh, that economic development argument up. Jonathan, from the economic development argument, is, it, 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 is that being missed on a lot of people? I think it may be. I think you do see uh, this move by the leadership, especially in South Carolina, to align the curriculum in K through 12 and even at higher ed with the needs of industry. For example, we have what's called the Smart State Program. We create endowed chairs to help existing or uh, locating mm -hmm. industries improve their processes through research at the universities. Is On that a specific workforce development initiative, though, between the, the uh, commerce and the you know, the recruited company in the school, or is this a broader initiative? This is more education-driven, I would say, um, more than workforce. Uh, this is helping plants improve on whatever processes they may need. Or it can be anything from advanced materials to logistics, mm -hmm. um, and this is run out of the universities. On the K-12 through level, what we have in 2005, the legislature passed the Economic Development and Education uh, Act of 2005, which sort of put students on career paths to 
industry sectors in South Carolina. Okay, so Molly, back to you. When when you talk about when you talk about you know we we just don't know what kind of impact it will be. There are core people that know, but what is what is more broadly missed? And specifically, com communities and schools nationally, and certainly your group in Charlotte, have something to do with graduation rates. You focus on that. So is is that kind of the point that we need to look at? It is. People need to understand that the greatest economic stimulus package that we can invest in in a community is to ensure that we have a high graduation rate from high school. Uh, we've got to make sure our kids are educated. Uh, if you look at just just the dropouts in the Charlotte, Mecklenburg, Gastonia, Concord region, every year 11,000 students do not graduate. If we could just graduate half of those, if we could take 5,600, the implications economically would be tremendous. We'd have an increased annual tax revenue of $6.5 million. We'd have increased earnings of over $40 million. You, know, you look mm -hmm. at home sales, auto sales, and, and just human capital in general. So people really need to start thinking about education as in business terms. Yeah, go ahead. Molly makes a great point. In fact, companies um, are not going to hire someone without a, a high school uh, degree it's because they want to know that they've developed some amount of skill to be able to get the jobs that they have open. And I, I saw a statistic the other day that there, at any given moment in, in this nation, there are 600,000 open manufacturing jobs. Mm -hmm. We've got an unemployment rate at 9.8%. So where's is, the disconnect there? The disconnect is in the skills gap. Um, companies can't e either find the skilled workers that they need or there's just not communication there for these workers that are seeking employment to know that those jobs are out there. Oh, okay, so uh, you know, I want to ask this question, and, and you, you, let's stay with South Carolina right. because you've got you've got those within their own party that don't agree on how education number one needs to be funded, and number two needs to be those funds need to be allocated over what is it? Is it cho choice schools? Is it neighborhood schools? Is, is it charter schools? So how, I, I guess the question is, if we doubled the budget, Jonathan, if we doubled or tri tripled the amount of money that we put toward it, would that fix education? You know, this is my own personal view and not necessarily a state policy, but I don't believe money in education is the end-all be-all. I mean, I think methodology has a large part to play as well. And I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all uh, approach to education. Different kids learn in different ways and different kids are looking for different things out of education. Some people want to get skills to go get a, a high paying quality job and other folks want to learn about the classics and philosophies and go teach and there's just, it's not a one size fits all approach and I think we need to look at the methodology because there's always going to be ebbs and flows in education funding unfortunately depending on what state economies mm -hmm. and national economies are doing. So I, I think a focus on methodology rather than funding yeah. Even though funding is extremely important, um, would be a better way to kind of look at this thing. W w is that how you characterize it, Molly? I, I, I would agree with some of Jonathan's points. I think, you know, I think resources are really important here. So, again, if we been... doubled the budget, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but if we doubled the amount of money we threw at education, would that fix a lot of the issues that come up in, politically? It wouldn't fix it alone. Um, I think it would certainly help, but it would have to take, we have to think differently about the way that we're working in education. I think we, it's, you know, it's great to have innovation. I think charter schools are breeding grounds for thoughtful ways to educate students differently. Um, but we can't believe that there's just one silver bullet, that we have to wipe the system clean and start from the beginning mm -hmm. with charter schools. That's not, that's not the only solution. We have to work within the system. We have to work outside of the system. We have to have public-private partnerships. We have to believe in programs like communities and schools. Communities and schools is great because we're partners with the system. We work within the schools. But we have the flexibility to do some really innovative work mm -hmm. with our students. But right now, I mean, it's, it's impossible to say, um, I, I think, to make the case that we have enough funds in the system mm -hmm. as is. There have been cuts across the board we've seen, especially to human services. We don't have the kinds of nurses, the kinds of social workers, the guidance counselors that we need to really support our students throughout that school process. Okay, Molly, thank you. That's going to be the last word, at least for the first part. We'll, uh, 
We'll pick this line up with our guest, Shirley. Um, uh, next week on the program, his name is Robert Hill, and he's been on this program before. He's the chief executive officer of South Carolina Bank and Trust out of Columbia. Uh, we'll talk to him not just about, a gr about the growth, but the dialogue going on around banks. Are they too big and too bad to fail? We'll find out. And then in two weeks, coming on this program, the CEOs of cities. Uh, mayors will be on this program, the mayors of both of all Asheville, Columbia, Greensboro, and Florence will be here. Uh, indulge me here just for a second because this is going to be a bit of a longer introduction than we normally do, but I'm, I'll be making a point. So at the risk of pandering, it is important to know that our guest is much more than one-dimensionally inclined toward education. He began his career Burlington Industries. He's a military veteran. He's the author of two books. He's officiated 400 college football games over 36 years, uh, routinely had been uh, uh, presiding over... Uh, Oh, games like the Rose Bowl, the, 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 the Florida Citrus Bowl, the Gator Bowl, the Orange Bowl, the Cotton Bowl, to name just a few, including the 2009 BCS Championship game. He is in the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame, among others. He is distinguished alum of ECU in North Carolina, graduate work at Appalachian State and Nova University. He's worked at Gardner-Webb, Meredith College, Furman University, and since assuming the top job at Wingate in 1992, has grown the school's enrollment by more than 100 percent while adding graduate programs, university status, and many other institutional accomplish, uh, accomplishments. Joining us now, Wingate University President Dr. Jerry McGee. Uh, congratulations Thank on all of that. Sir. How do you find time to do that, Dr. McGee? <laughs> well, you do have to learn a little time management along the way, but um, it's a little easier now that I'm no longer officiating. It's uh, It was pretty difficult to do a full day's work and to fly out on Friday night to Notre Dame and work a football game and be back in the office on Monday morning, but somehow you learn to balance your time and do what's important, and uh, I was able to do it. And how inspiring must have that, could have that been, right, with the, on the college bowl games, on the weekends, and then back yeah. in school? Uh, well, it was really fun for our students because uh, I'd go to the cafeteria every Monday and let them give me the business about my game on Saturday. About your calls. And, uh, <laughs> they particularly enjoyed the Saturdays where I maybe got knocked down or somebody <laughs> particularly yelled at me a lot and that sort of thing because they, they're not used to people yelling at me. Well, uh, let's get to your, uh, I call it your core competency, at least for the, for the sake of this discussion, <laughs> Dr. McGee. But uh, you've heard the dialogue that we've been talking about, the K-12 through and the primary. When you look at the freshman classes over the last couple of years, the last five years, do you see that they are more prepared, less prepared, about the same? What are the challenges? I, I think at, at, at Wingate University, they are more prepared. Uh, I think that... Uh, the students who are graduating from high school who are motivated to, to look for a meaningful college experience, uh, they know early on that they've got to really work hard and, and, and do their best. And so when they come to us, they're usually prepared to do the work. Uh, the, the people in higher education that I deal with worry more about the students that we never see. We worry about the ones who did not finish high school. Because uh, if you really want to live a life of significance now in the United States of America, you simply have to have a high school diploma, and it really helps if you have a, that, uh, a baccalaureate mm -hmm. sheepskin as well. Mm -hmm. Molly, question? Well, I, you know, I don't know what to compare them to in terms of being more or less prepared, but in terms of just looking at basic statistics, if you look at the North Carolina state system, mm -hmm. Um, right now we have about 45% of the students who aren't graduating in five years. If you look at um, CPCC, uh, Central Piedmont Community College, one of the great community colleges in this nation here in Charlotte, of the CMS students, of the Charlotte Mecklenburg School students who attend CPCC, over 70% require remediation. And you think about the challenge that that, prevents, that that presents a student when they enter into that college system to already be behind. Do, do you, uh, I'm sorry, do you have a question to, to respond to that? Or do you have a question to follow up with Dr. McGee with that? Yeah, so I, I would love to know what, you know what is it that we need to do to better prepare our students? Where are the gaps that you're seeing? Uh, I think that we coddle them way too much, especially early. Uh, you mean before they get to school? No, when, they're, when they're in... K through 12. I think that, uh, that maybe we don't challenge them quite enough. Uh, parents are very involved on that level. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I think it would be uh, better to have a little less parental involvement mm -hmm. in the dailiness of the school activities. 
But I think that just having a high expectation for your children and then sending them to the professionals and let them deal with them is probably a good thing. But the, uh, uh, it's hard to generalize when you're talking about all the high school graduates in North Carolina. But at Wingate, I guess because of all the uh, extensive uh, uh, health care professions that require really top-notch students, that, that we get maybe the, the little higher-end students. And so we find they're very well prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, I hear the stories about uh, remediation, but we, uh, we do very little or none of that anymore. Mm -hmm. That's great. John? Yeah, one of the things the industry in South Carolina is always concerned about is workforce. And, and uh, in higher ed, I sort of view co-ops and internships and apprenticeships and, and those sorts of things as a, a workforce program in higher ed. Do y'all put a strong emphasis on that? And is that something you see in higher ed? We certainly do. In fact, we require almost every student now to, to have an internship. And it just gives them real life experiences that you just cannot gain from the classroom. Uh, I, I, listening to you from off stage, I, I think South Carolina maybe is a little ahead of North Carolina in terms of partnerships with the, the corporate community, the business community, and the, and the colleges and universities. Because I, I think we have way too much duplication of programming in North Carolina, while at the same time maybe there are some potential jobs that are being unfilled because we're not training workers. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. there are 14 MBA programs in Charlotte. Do we really need 14 MBA programs in Charlotte? I think that's no. over the top. That's just way over the top. And, but there are probably some other areas in, in this area that we are not training people appropriately. So I think more conversation between the corporate and business community and the college and universities is really a great thing. So, so, I congratulate South Carolina on doing that. So, so let me follow up with that. So did, did you have you felt compelled to jump into the fray with the MBA program? No, we were actually... We had our program in 1992, so our program's been around for a long time. But just in the last five or six years, there's probably been another six or eight programs to come mm -hmm. here. Large population, uh, strong business community. So there's kind of an assumption that if the other five or six schools are doing well with their MBA, maybe we should have one as well. And there's been a little piling on, and I think that's <laughs> happened in a, in a lot, of, uh, lot of areas of, of higher education. We like to do the simple things and things we're comfortable with. But how many school teachers do we really need to be preparing in a year uh, or should we mm -hmm. be training more biotech folks? And, and I think uh, we, we kind of go to the uh, path of least resistance sometimes and try to do what makes us comfortable, but we need to really look hard at doing the right thing for the future mm -hmm. and think more long-term in terms of our association mm -hmm. with the corporate business community, I think. Wow. So how, in, in terms of thinking about developing curriculum and um, courses of study to prepare for the future, how have you gone about thinking about that? It, clearly it's paid off because you have students coming there who see a real future at Wingate. Yeah, I think the best thing we did was back in the mid-90s when our new administration got in place, we literally went to the business community and the corporate community and said, okay, uh, we want to do the right thing. We're still a fledging four-year school, but we want to make sure we're focused on what you need. Tell us what you need. In all honesty, we were thinking about adding a law school. And we went out to the community and they said, we don't need lawyers, we need pharmacists. Yeah. And so we came back and looked at one another and said, well, maybe we should look at this. And we did a year and a half study and it fit our business model and worked fine for us. And uh, now we have uh, physical therapy and uh, physician assisted and nursing and all these healthcare programs and they all started because our friends in the healthcare community said we need professionals. And I think there needs to be a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you saying nice things about South Carolina, but one of the things that everybody <laughs> from the outside looking in at North Carolina looks at is the research triangle. Yeah. Is there any best practices or, or anything that they're doing in that region that, that you as President Wingate have, have learned from? Uh, I, I actually had the opportunity to serve three years as head of the Economic Development Committee in, in uh, Union County. And I know they got tired of hearing about the Research Triangle Park because I right. talked about it all the time. But, but I think that was a great example of someone willing to dream really big dreams. Mm -hmm. I don't think our dreams are big enough sometimes in North and South Carolina. I think we need to be uh, looking at a way to not only have another Research Triangle Park, but a better one and maybe a bigger one and create more jobs. But, but I think that the, the great lesson there was together the... Research Triangle institutions and corporate community 
went together and dreamed big dreams and, and put together a plan, and uh, it changed all of our lives in a certain way. So, so we'll stay, let's stay on that. Then, how do you get, how do you get? I guess, Doctor McGee, the question: How do you get the politics out of education, and how do we get down that road where we are working together? I mean, here in South Carolina, it's been historic. You fi they finally got USC, Clemson, and MUSC working together. In many ways, I mean, who would have thought, right? Yep. Uh, so, how, as an educator, as is with a major school, how do you reach across not just political boundaries, but how do you do, to to get together with other educators and say, look, you have that school, we'll have this school. We don't need to compete. We just need to look down the same road together. I might be the only university president in America that thinks that's a really great idea, uh, <laughs> but. We, we do a pretty good job as, as spending time together and planning together as, as independent schools. I think the community colleges do a pretty good job of getting together and planning, and I think the, the university system as well, but we don't ever get in the same room with them. And I think there, there certainly needs to be a nonpartisan, if you can accomplish that, group to look at the future needs in North Carolina and South Carolina and say, okay, Let's get these four schools focused on this area, these four schools focused on another area. And, and I really think that's part of the answer. Uh, no board of trustees or no president probably wants to, to go down that road, but I think it's what we have to do. We have to make ourselves uncomfortable and do the mm -hmm. right thing for the state of North and South Carolina mm -hmm. and, uh, and more conversation, uh, more planning, mm -hmm. more uh, dialogue between all the partners uh, it's just crucial to that. Well, maybe now that you're done retiring, you've retired from running up and down the, the you know, the football field, you could lead that effort? I would be pleased yeah. to be involved in that. Uh, we have about three or four minutes, Molly. Oh, well, I would, I would love to know, Dr. McGee, when you, when you think about dreaming big, what are some of those dreams that have crossed your mind? Well, I think there should be a, a medical school in Charlotte. Uh, I, I think that the right people getting in the room could make that happen. I'm not sure who the sponsoring institution would be, uh, but I think we need to be thinking in, in those terms. Um, I would like to see uh, the term uh, acquisitions and mergers enter into the higher education. We have several really struggling institutions around the Carolinas, and just a few miles down the road, there's a school that's doing very well. Why can't, why can't the leadership of those schools get together and have some conversation about how can we make one another stronger? It's worked in business mm -hmm. for a long time, but I just think things like that are sort of out of the box thinking that we've got to do when we think long term about our state mm -hmm. and states. Mm -hmm. John? Well, Chris, following up on what you were talking about earlier, uh, Clemson and Carolina collaborating is like cats and dogs living happily together. Yeah. But uh, a lot of that was pushed by industry. Industry yeah. said, with the Smart State program, hey, this is what we need. You guys work together and collaborate. This is not going to be you versus you and who can get the most out of these smart state chairs. We want you all to work together. What sort of communication lines do you all have with industry and higher ed? We, we have a little bit nearly enough. Obviously, we right. all participate in, in uh, state chamber activities together, and we all uh, are in very active with the local industry in our areas. But but generally speaking, and on a large basis, there's there's not nearly enough communication. I, I think that I, all of us would welcome the opportunity to, to make sure that we're providing the future employees that industry needs. Uh, I, I tell our folks at Wingate all the time that we ask them to send us students. We ask them to support us financially. We ask them to provide internships for our students. We ask them to hire our students when they graduate. The least we can do is make sure that we're providing the kind of employees that they need for the future. But it requires dialogue, and I, I just don't think we're doing a very good job, and I would love to be a part of a, of a group to sit down and think about how we could do a better job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, in about 30 seconds, the new BCS format, is this something good? <laughs> uh, follow the money. You know, it's, <laughs> the, the, the presidents and athletic directors on that level are going to, are going to do what it generates the most money, not necessarily the best team, but uh, it's it's uh, changes everywhere, and yeah. change is going to happen there. But uh, I suspect that if uh, TV will put up the billions, uh, they'll the, the, the schools will provide yeah. whatever they want in terms of uh, well. Um, Dr. McGee, come back and we have more time to talk about enrollment. We we want to get you on the record for that too. But yeah. thank you for being here. Thank you very much. It's Good a to see you.
Jonathan, good to have you here. Thank you. Molly, welcome back. Thank you. Come back again. Um, till next week, I'm Chris William. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.